What's up, y'all, and welcome into the Jack Vita Show. I am your host, as always, Jack Vita, talking some November baseball. We only have a maximum of two games left this year, two more baseball games, maybe one more baseball game. The Philadelphia Phillies have fallen. Now, they're not out of it, but they're down, and the Houston Astros have taken a 3-2 World Series lead. The White Sox have named a new manager and I'm sure we'll talk some other baseball along the way today. Uh, last week, we had a great show with 2008 World Series champion Kyle Kendrick, who's actually been in Philly uh, for the festivities this week. And today we're speaking with another former player. Uh, seven years, eight years? Eight seven years, years, yep. Okay, seven years in the show. Uh, White Sox, Dodgers, Blue Jays, Indians. Nice. <laughs> Oh, that was off my memory, man. I don't even have the note sheet here. Well done. <laughs> Michael I have Hong. trouble remembering it sometimes, so <laughs> very well done. Uh, speedy outfielder Dan O'Dowd once said, I mean, he said this. He said, great defensive center fielder and even greater person, Michael Huff. Glad to have you here. How you doing? Oh, great to be back on the show, Jack. Doing well. Thank you. Yes. So we did this earlier in the season. Uh I don't think either of us had the Phillies getting this far. This is quite shocking. No, and, and we might have actually talked a little bit about one of my teammates in college, Joe Girardi, who had maybe just gotten fired. Um, we had, you know, they did it up it was in right Toronto. Before that. Things worked out really well. We did it, uh, you know, they did it in Philadelphia. Things worked out really well. Both teams got to the World Series. And um, as I'm sure you've talked about, sometimes it takes whatever the sport, football, basketball, baseball, do you get hot at the right time? Do things start to click at the right time? And for Philly, it really seemed like, you know, things came together for them perfectly. And they were just got on a little bit of a roll, started believing in themselves, um, not just the the, the multi-year, multi-million dollar star players doing well and coming through, but you had your role players like the Mike Huffs that were contributing. And when that happens, you know, any team can be dangerous and Philly definitely got hot at the right time. What year was that for you? Uh, for me, I had a couple of years, um, 93 with the White Sox when we made the playoffs, there was not a whole lot of playing time, but uh, the next year, 94 up in Toronto, the year potentially the White Sox had a chance to break the curse, which they ultimately did in 2005 in Montreal, they were, incredible and that might have saved baseball in montreal but that was the year of the strike but that year hitting uh i think sixth in the lineup in toronto was the one year i hit over 300 and again you, I, I could tell because toronto had just beaten us in chicago in 93 and i got traded at the end of spring training um just how when you have people at, at the bottom of the order um, or even at the top of the order that are just or, or great defensive plays or, or middle relievers that give you two or three innings of zeros that you are hoping, you know, maybe they give up one run. That's when you start to have that feeling in a clubhouse amongst each other that this is the makings of something special. Yeah, I think something that's really impressed me about the Phillies is – I really think their team chemistry has been a big part of this because yep. there's something with they get up to play every game, especially when they're in that ballpark. I mean, prior to these last couple games, they were 6-0 and at Citizens Bank Park, but they didn't just do it by winning all their home games. They had to go to St. Louis and win those two games in St. Louis. There's something about the synergy and the chemistry of this team, and I think that's where Rob Thompson – their new manager should get some credit for, for whatever reason. Cause a lot of times, Michael, a lot of the times we see these teams, Hey, they have the fourth highest payroll in the league. They bring in a bunch of different assets and they don't gel. I didn't think this was going to work out this well. I was wrong. Well, I, I was too. I, I think, you know, knowing a good friend, Joe Girardi was the manager. They had a number of injuries early on and they just, Joe, for whatever reason, was unable to kind of get the guys playing together. And like you said, finding that chemistry. So you have to give Rob Thompson huge credit. A, the team started to get healthy, but B, he was able to, to, to send a message that my guess is was or is pretty similar to Joe's because Joe wouldn't have him as a bench coach if they couldn't right. get along 
But the, the little bit of the tweak, again, I'm, I'm sure you've talked to people, be it a pitching coach or a hitting coach, that says sometimes the same thing as the previous hitting coach did. But for the player, it connects just a little bit differently. And all of a sudden, he's making contact more regularly. And subsequently, he's getting more hits. So sometimes you need a different voice. Sometimes you need a little bit different perspective. And I think Rob, again, has done an incredible job to bring all those big contracts, all those big personalities together and has found that tremendous success in the second half of the year. Yeah, I think that's a really good point considering he, Girardi brought him onto the staff. So yep. it can't be such a, such a radically different change. Right. I know uh, Dan O'Dowd, he had told me like, one year they had to fight he had to fire clint hurdle and he hated having to do it but after they did it the, the team just started playing better and he said really it shouldn't have made any sense but right. sometimes just something like that can spark something in a team unfortunately someone loses their job right. as a result of that well and clint's i think having a pretty good time doing some broadcasting he's very good at it but you're right i mean you, you, uh, for me having played for people or with people like an ozzy Gian, who's incredibly vocal to a cito gaston up in toronto who is the biggest behemoth of a person but speaks with a whisper it, i don't think that was like the 180 degree turn that philadelphia got going from joe to rob but i think again the message was enough different um and the clubhouse was able to change and again you are in an incredible division with both the mets and and atlanta two incredible teams that had great years but they were able down the stretch to start to bring it together and understood every series it's just you know give me three starts give me you know four starts and our hitters will put up enough runs and they've been able to do that both at home on the road the home was incredible that run they had and, yeah. and it took truly it, it took you know a, a historic day with the no hitter to stop it um i was very surprised again last night that i i, I my hope was that Justin would have that type of performance just to kind of get the monkey off his back and other people off his back. Um, but I kind of expected a, a three to two, four to two game going Philly's way, not necessarily going Houston's. Yeah, I was I was surprised by last night, too, to tell the truth. I thought that Philly was going to win and this is going to probably go to seven was my yeah. thought at that point. Same my here. pick coming in, I had the Houston Astros in six which looks pretty strong right now. We'll <laughs> yes. talk about why that might not be the case a little later. But to touch on what you brought up with Verlander, I wrote this piece yesterday and I was thinking, you know, this is a this could be a career defining start for Justin Verlander in the sense that, you know what? He's age 39, he had Tommy John surgery and he had a great regular season, not a great postseason however, and he he says he wants to pitch until he's 45. He's a free agent this winter who knows if he's going to stay in Houston maybe he goes to another team we don't know how many more moments we're going to see Justin Verlander on this stage this could be the last one that we see him pitching in a World Series game and like you said you know it, I don't think it was heavily discussed prior to this postseason but entering play last night six career po uh, World Series starts ERA in those six games or over sorry eight games was over six, the ERA, and he was 0-6. He had gone the most amount of starts in the World Series of any pitcher without picking up a win. Last year, he get, last night, he got the win. I think that was huge just because, you know what? Look, nonetheless, had he not won, had the Astros lost, had he not pitched well, he's still a Hall of Famer. But the way that people are going to remember him is sometimes you remember some of these guys towards the end, some of their last big moments. And I think this was huge for his legacy and the way that people remember him is again, we could see him again in this moment next year. Maybe he has an even better moment then, but this was as big of, it may have been the biggest start of his career. The Astros needed to win this game, not as much as the Phillies did, but he put them in a position now to clinch uh, their first World Series title since 2017. They can do that Saturday or Sunday. They got two games at home in Houston to do that in front of their fans. But um, this is a hostile road environment, too. Yeah. This is a tough place to play against an explosive lineup that was hungry to score some runs after being no hit the night before.
Well, and and think about how they started the game. I mean, Schwarber hits a home run. So, you know, in the back of everyone's mind for Philly, it's like, yep, we're going to get him for at least six because that's what he's done historically in the World Series. For Verlander, it's like, are you flipping kidding me? Like this, this can't really be the case. And so, again, tip your cap that he was able to, you know, weather that storm and a couple others and pitch the way he did to get them into a position um, allowing Houston to get a few more runs and, and get the win. And I thought Dusty man, uh, Dusty Baker managed his pitching staff very well last night. I like what he did. A knock on him for years has been he that he sometimes leaves the starting pitcher in there too long. He pulled Verlander, Verlander after five innings, turned it over to their bullpen. Bullpen did a great job. And now Houston is heading home with a 3-2 lead. This series flipped. 180 degrees very, very quickly because it was yeah. starting to look like, hey, you know what? Philly might close this thing out at home. Well, especially after the first game. I, I, again, it took a historic, you know, no hitter in the second to stop the momentum. But I, I think having won this game, I, I think if Philly had won this game, they would feel very good going to Houston knowing they'd just have to win one out of two. And I think for Houston, they needed to win this game to prove that it doesn't take a historic moment to beat this Philly team, we can just play our game. Great pitching, great bullpen, great defense, which we saw again last night. Yeah, it, it's it's in some ways that is the one thing. I think you're going to be right. I, if I was a betting man, I would put money on Houston for Game Six. But to think about at the end of the season, what team should win the World Series? You would hope that it is a team that plays solid defense that has good if not great starting pitching a good if not great bullpen and a lineup that's balanced and that's kind of exactly what Houston is and you have to give that organization a lot of credit which again I think is still the 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 thing that for a lot of baseball people myself included it is hard to understand why you were cheating as much as you were because you had created a system in an organization that could weather the storm you had a balanced lineup you had good players coming in through the minor leagues so you had done everything right and and you you had to do this other stuff and i think the way there were several of the players in some of the front office that i don't think really acknowledged how <laughs> egregious it was and kind of apologized, but it didn't really feel like an apology. I think that's still where a lot of people are anti-Houston. Um, but for Dusty, you know, stepping in now, the career he's had, I've, I've heard various people in the baseball community say the one thing they've noticed about Dusty is that over time, over all those years that he's managed, he's kind of evolved as a manager. I mean, he's understood analytics. He's trusted more people around him um, and has done a great job of understanding sort of the, the new player and the new game, so to speak, and not just kind of being stuck in the past when he played or when he first started managing. And and I think it showed up, like you said, yesterday. If this was 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, you probably would have put Justin out there because Justin's like, I can still go. And he'd be like, great, keep going. Until you give up a couple hits, that's when I'm going to pull you. But now he's like, wait a minute. I trust my bullpen. I trust the information I have in front of me. I have a guy that I want to make sure has that opportunity for a win. And if we just do what we normally do, we'll win the game, which is ultimately what happened. Yeah, and I'm typically I typically err on the side of, hey, let your starter go as long as you can get mm -hmm. stuff out of him. However, last night, just kind of like what we're talking about with Justin and how he had struggled. And in the other the other thing is that in addition to he you know, he pitched well, but it wasn't it wasn't like a flawless outing. Right. He had right, got right, into right. two or three different yes. games that he had to pitch himself out of. Right. And we give him credit for that, but it wasn't like you know, when Kyle Hendricks was cruising in game seven of the World Series in 2016, and it's like, how can you pull this guy? It wasn't like that. Right, I thought right, Dusty right. read it so well. Yep. It's like, okay, we got the most out of him that we can, and we have a great bullpen, and right. we're going to use that. Yep, I would agree. The yep. other thing that I think we're seeing here as to why this series shifted uh, in terms of we went from 2-1 Philly to now 3-2 Houston one of the big things 
maybe the biggest thing is we're seeing the importance of having a deeper pitching staff. And like you said, Mike, about the defense, because I think that Philly, this is one thing I'd actually like to change. I'd like to make the division series a best of seven series because as it is right now with the wild card, which, you know, what, I don't have a big problem with this new wild card format because you're, you are rewarded for your regular season success by getting to two, maybe three straight home games. And if you can't win those games at home, then you're probably not, you're not going to do anything in the playoffs anyway. So I got no problem with that. The thing that I'm not too crazy about is this new, uh, these teams could get iced and then it's a short series. The thing is we play 162 games. We want, and traditionally like you, you played in an era when there were only two divisions. Yeah. Four two, teams made the playoffs. That's it. Yeah. You, you win your division, you play the, the East or the West yep. and the winner goes to the world series. Yep. And what that did was it made every regular season game and the regular season so important Mm-hmm. And if we make this postseason too big, we're going to end up devaluing the regular season and people losing interest in the regular season, which is something that has happened with the NBA because more than half the teams make yes. the playoffs in the NBA. Yep. So having said all of that, I want teams that are good in the regular season to have good performance in the postseason. One thing that did happen, however, in this postseason is Philly's pitching staff, as we talk about, not as deep as Houston's. They've got two studs, uh, and then Suarez is good. But what we saw in this series, in a best-of-seven series, and I know you know, they, they did play San Diego, and San Diego was a best-of-seven, but they were also a team that benefited from a short series that got into that game. Yes. Yep, so yep, yep. I'm really – I don't want to take anything away from Philly because they did everything they could to get in this spot. However, I don't believe that they were actually the best team in the National League this year, but they got here. We give them credit for that. And now when they go toe-to-toe with a team like Houston, you're seeing how 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 much the depth in the rotation is. They didn't even have to move Verlander up for this Game 4 start. They could have had him on full rest pitching in Game 4. Dusty trusted the depth of his pitching staff – Verlander got an extra day's rest. That's a huge luxury for a guy who's 39. Oh, gosh, yeah. But uh, uh, the counter to that is even in a five-game series, you would think you've got to use at least three, if not four, starters. I I, I like the five days. I think it forces you. But I, I am a big advocate that there should not be off days. You, you play – Three games at home, you're on a plane at 11 o'clock at night, you get in at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're playing a game that afternoon like or that evening in the next town. If you really want to see like how deep a rotation is, you play every day. Like You play five games straight, and maybe game three or game two ends up being an afternoon game not a seven o'clock at night game. And that has to be the first game so that the teams can get on a flight at seven and get into the next town by 10. And they're still in bed by midnight, so to speak. Um, But I think that would answer, you know, or address the point you're making. Like now I have to have four starters, not just three. And I may, if my ace can go on game five, it's going to be on short rest. But I, I now have to use more of a, a of a full rotation versus a partial rotation to get to that World Series. So, uh, again, I think going seven games, like you said, if, if your play-in series is now five, not three, I like three. I like the, the better record gets all three games at home. Yeah, I would keep that. I like that. I think I'm okay with five. I, I could probably be persuaded for seven, but I would rather see – you playing five games back to back to back to back to back and and really kind of stressing the importance of a full pitching staff and a full bullpen. So a hundred years over a hundred years ago, they had a best of nine World Series. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a little much. You might start to lose some people there. <laughs> but now again, I, I, I would love to say it's seven games and and you're playing, you know, maybe your first five straight you know, two, three, like 
five in a row, and then you get an off day to fly back to whoever gets the last two games at home. So you do have one break in there. But, yeah, I'm I, that always – and I understand the TV and I understand the whatever. And it's, you know, if, if it's LA, New York, the way it was so many times in years past, that's a, that's a long flight and that's hard on the body to adjust. So I kind of understand that, but there's still a part of me that feels like, well, you had to do that during the year anyways. So let, let me try this. Let me see if I can get you on this with the seven game DS. And by the way, I was fine with the best of five up until this year. The reason, the other reason why I would like to go to seven games for the DS is when you're a team like Atlanta, who was the hottest team in baseball, they were playing phenomenal. And you know what? Maybe they don't end up winning that series if it's a best of seven. I'm not saying that they do, but they would certainly cooled off in that week off that they had. Um, baseball's a sport, Mike, that you could tell. Oh, yeah. You could tell me, I'm sure, that you want to keep playing. You no. don't want to take a whole week off. No. And so I think if you were able – and then the other thing is, hey, when it's a best-of-five series, all of a sudden you lose a game one or a game three, that is such a bigger loss in a five-game series than it is in a seven-game series. I would like for those teams that have been iced for a week to get an extra couple of uh, games to work that rust off a little bit. Yeah, I, that, I, again, then I would say you're mismanaging your team. I, I I would be surprised if all of those teams weren't doing simulated games. I'd yeah. be very surprised if all those teams weren't trying to create so a game. So would you say the simulated games like that, that's good enough to keep you loose? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, okay. you're calling up your best AAA players. I mean, you're not using any of your starters, obviously, unless they're just throwing in the bullpen or they may come out and throw just one inning or two innings. But you get out there and, and, you know, you have something that's an internal, you know, championship that there's like money might be 50 bucks, 20 bucks, or it's bragging rights. But you, I, I would be surprised if those teams aren't out there trying at least a couple of those days to have a simulated game where you're trying to get into a game situation. You're, you know, guys are hitting doubles or triples. You have to get the cutoffs lined up right. But you're bringing up some of your young, you know, talented pitchers and letting them pitch against the big league hitters. So I think it would be a win-win if Atlanta or if whoever just sat back and did nothing over those five, six, seven days. Yeah. I, I think they deserve to lose, <laughs> but to your point, it is hard. I mean, we are creatures of habit. And when you're playing 162 games over 180 days, you know, your, your, your body starts to get into a rhythm. And even though you might be very sore and tired, at the end of the season, because it's been six long months, you are still in a rhythm. And like you said, to cut that rhythm off completely and have to sit and do nothing in terms of that intense environment for five days and expect the light switch to go back on, that that is really challenging. Yeah, it gives a team like Philly to start building up some of that momentum and get right. hot. Yep. So uh, let me ask you one more thing about playoff format. What are your thoughts on the 2-3-2 two, two format in the World Series? For those who don't know what we're talking about, in the CS in the World Series, the team with home field advantage gets the first two games in their ballpark, then plays the next three games on the road, then plays the final two games if we get to a game six and a game seven. For me, I, I understand why they do it. They want to limit travel. You would be able to tell me how big a different, how important that maybe it is to potentially get those three games in in a row rather than having stretching the series out, having a couple extra travel days, which maybe you don't want to see that because you'd rather have the games be played every single day. But the one thing that has always been odd to me is the team that has home field advantage does not receive an advantage unless the series goes all the way to seven games because through right. the first five, they're the team that's at the disadvantage. Yeah, I mean, I I love the 2-2-1-1-1, two, two, one, one, one. but I think in today's world with the TV, with the travel, um, in some ways you would think, you know, you've got chartered flights. It's not like you're on a train anymore. So <laughs> um, I really like that because, yeah. again. And then, I, by the way, the NBA switched over to that about seven or eight years ago. They used to be doing the 2-3-2, two, two, and now they're doing the 2-2-1-1-1-1-1. Two, two, one, 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 one. Oh, yeah. too many ones, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> two at home, two on the road, and then home away, home. I, I, I like that a lot. 
Um, I think it gives the home team the advantage to try to get those first two, but then you get to the second two. And if you're splitting both, then great. It's a best of three, but I still get two games at home, but I'm not putting them right back to back. I'm making it, again, as equitable, as even as possible with the understanding that the better record, the better team gets the four games at home versus three games on the road. So in the perfect world, you know, we have faster planes and this can happen. And the guys are, you know, even if it's a New York to LA, you know, it's a two hour flight, not a six hour flight. And the guys' bodies, you know, adjust just fine. And I know that you want to get the season done by a particular date, but there's, there's also a level of like, you know what? It's the last series of the year. And even in the CS, it's like, we're, okay, we're really winding down. If we have a rain out or some, for some reason, this series ends up taking a little longer. I don't really see that that as a big problem. I Maybe I'm missing something. No, no, no. I'd be happy to bring it. I mean, again, if you want to extend the playoffs, bring it back to 156 game season. Yeah, that'd be 162. fine. Yeah, take a couple series out, one home and one road, take six games off the plate. Go to the players, go to everybody and say, you know, we're going to cut your salary by 6% because we're cutting revenues by 6%. I don't think anyone's going to have an argument with that from money's coming in to money's going out. It's still a lot of money. And if you're taking that much off to get that much time for your body and to make the game better, uh, the games, like you were saying, more impactful in a shorter period of time, I, I, I would be more than two thumbs up for that. And then, like you said, now you can change up the playoff format by adding some more games because you have some more time to be able to do that. Yeah, I actually, so the one thing is if we cut the amount of games, ticket prices will be a little more expensive. I don't think it would be terrible though. If it's six less games, that's three less home games or, right. and then the other thing is it's like you said, I don't know when 162, I'd have to look to see what year 162 became this like round number that we play every single year. But that has not always been the case. At one point, oh, right. I, th I think they played 148 for a while. Yep. So even if you went all the way down to 148, I would not have a huge problem with that. I would have a problem if you significantly cut it. And now we're talking about 120 games, which right, I, right, right. I've had some friends say, oh, you know, they should really shorten the season and let more teams in the playoffs. And I'm like, you're you're not a baseball fan. I, I'm sorry. I'm not taking right. your opinion seriously. Like, that would not be good. We we It's good the way it is. But we could, if we caught a few, I don't think that'd be a problem. Right. And I think the whole reason for the expanded playoffs was to give more teams that chance of, did I have significant injuries early in the year? Did I, you know, bring a, a player over, make a trade midway through the season? And that player took a while to impact our team. So I like the fact that for baseball, you've expanded, but you've expanded nominally. You've yeah. allowed some of those other teams, again, in a division that has a, a, a New York and, and in Atlanta that are just, you know, playing at the top of their games. And it takes you a while to find your stride but you're still a really good ball club as we have seen that with Philly in the world series. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know how much more I would want to expand it. Um, I think the three, five, seven was easy and, and it was a concept that the players could buy into and the owners could buy into. Um, I think the fans have bought into it. And again, I think there's always ways that you can tweak it to make it a little bit better. And I'm fine with the tweaking. I just, to your point, I don't want to turn this into a basketball or a hockey that you know a third half the teams are getting in the playoffs because then it just diminishes why are you playing 162 games just play 100 games and make the playoffs that much longer yeah and i think that would be terrible because yes then no one would care about the right. regular season no one care about the rivalries right. when you get like how awesome was that braves mets uh race at the end of the year oh, and that's, yeah. that is one of the downsides to expanding the postseason is because like, aside from that, we didn't really have anything that was down to the wire. The Brewers and the Phillies were going for that last spot, but there's no rivalry there. It's not right. like that's a big thing. And neither team was playing very well at the end of the right. year. So right. I, I would have personally waited to expand the postseason once we expand to 32 teams, which I think is going to come eventually. And then you could basically adopt what the NFL's format used to be you could even have four different divisions. I think that would be 
perfect. I would love that. Right. We expanded before that. That's fine. But let's not let's not make it any bigger. I think this is a pretty good number for now. And if we add or when we add two more expansion franchises, whether it be Nashville or Charlotte or Vegas or San Antonio, Austin, wherever it is that they want to go to in these uh, in these expansion franchises, then the six is going to be an even better number because there'll be more teams fighting for fewer spots. And I think that then you'll have a team this. So Philly's 187. Maybe now you're looking at a team that's winning 88, nine or 90 as that last team into the playoffs. Right. Totally agree. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Obviously there's a lot to dissect, dissect with this series. Um, Another thing I the reason why I mentioned this is yes the Astros are the favorites to win now um, as they were this whole series and now you expect them to take game six. The one thing I will point out, however, is that this is a very familiar territory with the Astros. The Astros have been in three of the last four World Series and in each of them they played a different National League East team. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. And that's, that's I think, pretty remarkable. If a division sends three different teams to the World Series in four years, tells you a lot about um, the front offices and player development, all that stuff, the strength of that division, because there are some other divisions that are quite not, not yeah. quite that strong. No. Um, but what I'd also add in addition to that is that the Astros were in the same exact spot three years ago. Against the Nationals, wild card team, National League East had a three-two lead going yep. back to Houston, and they laid an egg and they lost the first game six to two or seven to two, and then the next game six to two. I am certain that the Astros remember that. Oh they, yeah, there's billboard material. They're talking about yeah. it on the plane, and I'm sure you know the things that Dusty is saying is that that was that team. We're a different team. Like that team had these strengths and weaknesses. Ours are different. That team had these players. We're different. Like let's get back to playing our game, the type of game that we have played all year, the type of game that we have played. You know, and I, I'm sure Dusty's like, you know, we're not going to play like we did in Game Five. Let's, you know, we're not pitching a no hitter. Like we're not going to have a team pitch a no hitter. But let's think about what we did in game five. And I'm sorry, in game four. Let's think about what we did in game five. Let's think about what we did, you know, in, in the win at home and, and, and playing that complete game. And I'm sure that's what he's getting these guys to focus on. Part of what's been really remarkable about the Astros, obviously they did some shady stuff, uh, which we we've already touched on. Mm-hmm. But the thing that I think is really remarkable is how well that they have drafted and developed players because oh, yeah. I'll give an example, Jeremy Pena, he's probably going to, he's definitely going to finish top five in American league rookie of the year voting mm-hmm. this year. He's probably, he's not going to win it. Julio Rodriguez will win it, but I mean, this guy looks like a superstar. I was yeah. just thinking about this, Mike, would you rather have Jeremy Pena or Carlos Correa right now? I would probably, I think I'd take Pena because he's an even better defensive player. Well, and again, it's kind of, are you picking him now for a series or are you picking him now for the next 10 years? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say, you know, if it's a series, I'm probably still going with Correa. If it's uh, the next five or 10 years, I'm definitely going with Pena. And I think, again, Dusty Baker did like an incredible job of slotting him into that number two place in the order that you have so much protection behind you and your three, four, five hitters, you have this experienced person leading off in front of you and you just do what you do. You don't have to hit home runs. You don't have to just take pitches. You just be you because you are very good. And oh, guess what? You're going to see a lot of strikes because no one wants to walk you, especially if Altuve is on base because you got Alvarez and all these guys, Tucker coming up behind you. So you want to talk about the perfect place to put in a rookie um, but to your point, the glove looks so smooth. He looks so confident. And, and you think about Tucker in right field. You think about him at short. You think about the pitching staff and, and the development that those, you know, that organization has done to bring up. I mean, McCormick in center field, you know, he's to me a, a Mike Huff type guy that, that can hit a lot better. But, you know, someone that came up saying, hey, really good defensive guy, 
good glue guy, top of the order, bottom of the order, but plays a great defense, and he's just going to kind of be under the radar. But he has developed into a really productive hitter on top of everything else. And, you know, the reason he got there in the first place was the glove. And what did we see last night in the ninth? Made a Mike Huff catch last night. It was incredible. Like right into the fence. Perfect. You knew Tucker was talking to him. Tucker did a great job of coming in front. So just in case he missed it, he was going to be able to get the ricochet and probably keep Real Muto to a double instead of a triple. But just that is the type of complete game I think every fan wants to see. And, you know, Houston is doing that a little bit more than Philadelphia. We'll call it a hot take, but I would take not only for the next 10 years, I'd say for the next series, if they're, we're playing another series starting next week, I want Pena instead of Correa. Uh, Pena, these posts, this postseason, he's betting 333 with an OPS over 1,000, four home runs, eight RBI. He's a clutch player, and I'm not, yes. that's not a knock on Correa, but, I mean, no. Correa is hoping to get that massive – $300 million contract this off season and maybe he'll get it. The Astros replaced him with a guy who could end up being better than mm-hmm. Correa, at least, at least at this current stage of Correa's career. And he's being paid the league minimum. Yeah. He's, <laughs> it's allowing you to pay a lot of other people, a lot of money when you have people like he and Tucker that are at the bottom of that pay scale. So Again, I think that's that's the reason I think so many organizations like tip their caps to Houston right now is that when you can bring up and, and fill a leaving superstar with someone that you're hoping is going to be at 80, 90 percent of what the production was, but at a tenth of the cost. Now, all of a sudden, it's easy to kind of spread that money out and, and, and fill other holes. Well, guess what? Like you said, Pena isn't just 10% less than Correa. He is definitely equal, if not in this series, proving that he's better. And then on the pitching front, you've got Javier and Valdez, who are a couple of guys that they signed very cheap uh, several years ago. And those guys are, I mean, those have been their two best pitchers in this postseason. They've been untouchable. And then the other one I thought about, and again, the, the reason why I'm highlighting all three of the guys have highlighted and the next name I'm about to bring up. None of these guys were, Oh my gosh, this is a can't miss prospect. Mm -hmm. No one was talking about Pena. Um, The Astros farm system rankings for the last couple of years have been kind of towards the bottom in terms of uh, MLB.com. And I think it goes to show, you know what these rankings, these ratings, it's just someone's opinion. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. They've had a number of these guys. The other one I want to bring up, David Hensley, who starts at DH last night. He was a 26th round pick out of San Diego State. Six foot six shortstop infielder who they drafted in 2018. At no point in his career has he ever been a top 30 prospect. He comes in and he makes a start in the World Series. Um he, he started last night, but he also started game three. Gets a hit in his first at bat. These guys are big-time contributors. He batted, Mike, he batted 298, I believe, this year in AAA. And the year before that, he was their AA player of the year. Yep. Well, in Alvarez, Jordan come from the Dodgers, too? Yeah. So, yep. again, it's someone that the Dodgers thought, hey, we, you know, he's good, but he's not great. And Houston was able to kind of tweak something and make it great. I, I think – I. I the, uh, you probably said it a number of times on your show. I mean, <laughs> everyone in the minor leagues that's a prospect is really a suspect. Yeah. And partly because at the major league level, there is so much advanced scouting. And, and obviously the talent is even markedly better on a consistent basis in the major leagues and in AAA. But with all of the advanced scouting, all of the technology that's happening, y- you can have guys that are hitting – 250 in the minor leagues and all of a sudden they get to the big leagues and they're hitting 250 and you're like well I didn't see that coming but all of a sudden that 250 now has 25 30 home runs instead of 15 or 20 and other guys that are hitting 320 in the minors they get to the majors and and they are hitting 220 because 
the advanced scouting, their one hole in their swing is now just getting abused because every pitcher, or at least three out of four, four out of five, is hitting that spot consistently. And now that guy is rolling over and popping it up instead of getting the singles or triples or home runs he did in the minor league. So it, it is, people would ask me, you know, when I'm speaking to kids or, or parents at times, like, what was the biggest jump? We always hear like a ball to double A because there's two or three rookie teams, two or three A teams, only one double A. And I'm like, heck no. <laughs> biggest jump in talent comes from triple A to the major leagues because bunts that I was laying down in triple A, four out of five were hits, one out of five is a hit in the major league. So that the 20 triples I hit or 15 triples I hit in triple A, well, you know, 10 of those are gone because of where they're positioning me and five others are gone because the guys are running the ball down, not just diving and catching it. They're just faster. So like everything is different when you get to the major leagues, <laughs> the, the rollover three hopper to short in the hole that I'm safe by a step. I'm out by a step because the shortstop <laughs> is just that much better and has that much of a better arm. So um, it, it is neat to see certain organizations, again, sometimes that different voice in the ear, um, be it a hitting coach or a pitching coach, um, a confidence, which is huge in baseball, to actually believe you belong, not just think you belong, and then to have success that reinforces your gut saying, yes, I do belong here. And yeah, I may have a bad series or a bad week or whatever, but I belong here. And I think we're seeing that with people like McCormick. I think we're seeing that now with Pena. I, I mean, we've seen it with Alvarez, people coming into the organization that all of a sudden hear a message a little bit differently, have some success, partly because again, the one year I hit 300 in Toronto, when you have people like Paul Molitor and Joe Carter and Robbie Alomar Jr. and John Olerud and Devon White hitting around you, it's like, yeah, when I get up to the plate, it's like, oh, it's just Huff, who cares? And it's a <laughs> right down the middle. Well, same for some of these other guys. Pitchers are so worried about who's in front, who's behind if I roll over the line, but sometimes they actually breathe a little bit because it's only a McCormick or like you said, it's only a Hensley. It's now all of a sudden a pitch that they can hit. And because of their new thought process or, or the coach tweaking something a little bit, the swing is just a little bit smoother and now it's a base hit. And now like the lineup rolls over again and you're winning another ball game because the top of the order is getting five at bats, not just four. You were on one team that made the playoffs, right? Or 93. White 93. Yep. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm curious, did you feel a noticeable difference when you stepped into that ballpark in the postseason? Oh, the yeah. Regular season? Well, I, actually, not so much the postseason. The postseason, it was kind of like, you know, all of the, the corporate seats were taken by corporate people. Instead of during the season, corporate seats are like, oh, give it to Joe the salesman or the dock <laughs> worker. And you had like really rabid fans. Also in the playoffs, you have to share the seats with all of Major League Baseball. So when we were against the Blue Jays here, and it was so frustrating because we lost all three games at home against Toronto. We won two out of three up in Toronto. Um, but it, it there was a, a markedly different vibe in the playoffs than there was leading up to the playoffs. And as, as a player leading up was a lot of fun because it was a lot of Chicago people that were like living it with us and getting to the playoffs, finally beating the Oakland A's, which had that great team and that great run with Canseco and McGuire and all those guys, La Russa, you know, Eckersley was their reliever yet, uh, you know, the Dave Stewart's, the Ron Darling's, a great pitching staff. Um, so beating them and then getting to the playoffs was a lot of fun. When the series came, in the practice before, um, Gene Lamont, who was the great bench coach for Leland all those years with Pittsburgh and was our manager that year, tried to explain to us in the clubhouse before the practice day how, you know, as much as I want you to feel like it's different, I want you to feel it's the same. It's going to be different. So just embrace the fact that it's going to be a little different, but I want you to think and play like it's just a regular game. And we're all like, yeah, whatever. A couple of guys who had been to the playoffs, like George Bell, were like telling us a little bit about what it was be like. But when we came out of our clubhouse down the steps and through the doors into the dugout, um, there were, and we have a pretty long dugout at Guaranteed Rate Field. Um, there had to be three deep reporters from one end to the other. And I remember as I'm walking up, I think it might have been another role player, Warren Newson, or it might have been um, Tim Raines uh, that I just, or no, it was Lance Johnson. 
as we're coming up and we're seeing all these people, and we're trying to work our way through. I look at him and he looks at me and I was like, yeah, this is different, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's different. Um, so again, neat that the veteran players, the guys that have been there before, how much experience truly matters in playoff situations. And again, I think we're seeing with both clubs because both teams have plenty of guys that have been to the playoffs or, or have had that type of pressure situation on a regular basis, how they are able to relax, to slow the heartbeat down, to make it feel just like a game. And whether it's offensively or defensively, just you know, trying to, as, as the crowd gets louder in your ears, it gets quieter and it just becomes white noise that you can just focus on the baseball, focus on where you're supposed to be, and then reading the ball off the bat, making the play, whether you're an infielder or an outfielder. Mike, uh, we've only got so much time left, so let me get your pick here for what's going to happen. What You got? You think Astros close it out here in six? Yeah, I do. I, I think it, this is one of those that um, I, I think they've been there enough. Like you said, there's enough billboard material from when they lost um, to Washington that they're – going to be able to just play their game. And, and I think the way they have played, you know, great pitching, game four, great defense, good pitching, solid hitting in game five, I find it hard to believe that they're going to lose in six. Um, and if they do, I find it very hard to believe they're going to lose in seven. So I think your pick of, of Houston in six makes sense. Worst case, as much as I want Philly to win for a lot of different reasons, <laughs> I think Houston's going to get it. If not game six, they'll get it in game seven. The X factor to watch for in game six is Zach Wheeler because yes. Zach Wheeler against San Diego is like, you've got to be kidding me. Now, again, does does Philly turn around and have that no hitter type from their starter and bullpen? Yes, they have that capability, which – Again, it, it almost feels like that's what has to happen. And when you tell a pitcher or that pitcher feels like that's what he has to do, usually good things don't happen. You <laughs> want that just to naturally flow into a game. But, I mean, I don't know if he might be putting himself in that situation of thinking I have to pitch perfectly. Because um, <clears throat> if he does, again, I think it just bodes well for Houston. Well, the thing with Wheeler that I think will be really interesting to watch is well, last week when I spoke with Kyle, he said he was surprised that Wheeler wasn't going to be a game one starter because Wheeler is their best pitcher. And I would agree. I think he's their ace. Yep. Last year, I think he should have won the Cy Young. However, it was very interesting over this past week. He did not pitch well in game two of this World Series, which was last Saturday. Yep, He's going to have a full week of rest. Rob Thompson had said he got asked about their pitching. I mean, he could have thrown Wheeler in that game five instead of going to Syndergaard, which you would think that's something you would want to do. However, Thompson had said that Wheeler's been fatigued. He wants them to get some extra rest. So that's something that I think is something that's very important to watch for because he did not look anywhere near as sharp as he had been uh, prior to um, that last game. So it'll be very interesting to see what do they get out of him. Perhaps his, perhaps he is fatigued. Perhaps he's kind of running out of steam here. Maybe he can grit through and give him a nice five or six innings mm -hmm. with no runs or one run. But that is going to make a huge difference because if he is looking the way that he did in game two with Valdez on the mound, who is the Astros pitcher I least want to face right now. Same here. Yeah. So I, I also will favor the Astros. I bet key is Astros got to play to win game six. Can't think about we got right. two chances. You got to go for the kill right here. Yep. Yep. Especially if you have a lead. It's like you got to, you know, there's you know, the two schools of thought. Look, if, if it's three to two in the fifth inning, do we start to go to our best bullpen or do we, because we just used them two days ago, <clears throat> do we possibly save some of those guys if there is a game seven? You Like you said, you can't be thinking that. If Houston has a lead, I'd be very surprised if Dusty doesn't try to go back, especially because there's a travel day, go back to the same bullpen setup that he did in game five. So, Michael, you work for the Chicago White Sox, and you are the director of youth baseball. You played on the Sox. 
The White Sox hired a new manager this past week. And by the way, can you see what my I love is? your chapeau? Yes, I, I meant to say something. Yeah, it's very nice. So this is a special hat for Valpo Alumni Night. Yeah, it was a Valpo alumni event, which I didn't even know about as an alum. <laughs> and I happened to be at the game with one of my friends from Valpo. We wanted to see the Guardians play because we really enjoy how the Guardians oh. have played. Yep, yep. And so we went to it was the last game that they played each other this year. It was a Thursday night game. And we start seeing all this Valpo gear and we're like, what the heck is going on? We never see, we never run into Valpo people anywhere. It's a small, it's a small school, small alumni base. Turns out that we happened to just go to a game that there was a Valpo alumni event. And one of my friends who works for the team, works for the White Sox, he said, you didn't get a Valpo hat. I'm like, I didn't even know there was a Valpo hat. And he just Brought me over an extra one. So now I've got this very nice. wonderful, it's brown, yeah, it's yeah. yellow, brown, Valpo yellow colors, colors, Valpo yeah. White Sox hat. Um, personally, I think I think more teams should do this kind of stuff. I think it's cool if you can combine alumni or a university with a professional ball club. I'd, I'd be surprised if some aren't. Um, I, again, you think about like a, a Philadelphia, is there a temple night? I, I'd be surprised if yeah. there isn't and they're throwing like the tea on the side of the hat and handing those out. But the White Sox, again, are very conscious. Yeah. Um, Illinois night, a Northwestern night, a Valpo night. They understand, you know, where the fan base typically grow up and go to college. And again, they come back and they want to make this ballpark as inviting as possible to those alumni that they can have a, a great game hopefully watching the white Sox have some great food here at the ballpark but then be able to have that camaraderie and, and kind of have like a mini reunion um where you can tell lies and different professors or different you know events that were going on at the respective universities yeah i've said it before i'll say it again we won't dive into this right now the white Sox have a much better fan friendly experience at their ballpark than wrigley field i'll just say <laughs> that i will just say that <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. So I, I believe it and I see it, but it's, you know, when someone says, well, you played for them and well, you work for them. It's like, yeah, but you know, I occasionally do go to a game on the North side. If I have friends that are in town or a business associate that says, Hey Mike, I'm entertaining some people, you know, can you come out and help me with this? But it's, you know, White Sox are on the road. You know, they wanted to see a game. We're going to Wrigley. Are you okay with that? I'm like, of course I'm okay with that. You're my friend. I'm helping you with your business. But yeah, I mean, there it, there's a there's a marked different vibe in each of the two stadiums. And, and I would agree. Um, I do feel this is much more inviting and open, yeah. especially for families, um, for, you know, respective gatherings and stuff like that. It, it's, it's a pretty special place. Well, I mean, just... Quickly, I'll mention this. If they ever do a bobblehead giveaway, I've got some Cubs bobbleheads here. They're pretty cheap. They're not well made. <laughs> I've got my – oh, man, I can't reach it. i got my Hawk Solo yeah, uh, bobblehead, solo. Hawk yep. Harrelson. Yeah, they, I think the, the bobbleheads are great because everyone normally gets one. Or when they have a giveaway, it seems like you always get it. You don't miss out on that. Um, they've got great giveaways. It's well done. It's well made. The food is way better way better yeah the, the options and food it's 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 when my girls come in town to visit me it's always like we're going to a game regardless and they already have like their two things they definitely want to go back to like second inning fourth inning but they're like all right we're looking at the app and there's these new foods that you guys have or these new drinks i'm definitely trying some of those before <laughs> things close down so it yeah it, it is very fun it's a great place I, to come i've to. got a new favorite my new favorite is the heater which is the smoked sausage. Yes. Yeah, you've had that one, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we, again, it's fun that we get to try all these things beforehand. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty impressive stuff. So good. Okay, so the White Sox hired a new manager. They're announcing, a, I mean, they've got a lot coming up over the next week, but uh, Pedro Gafal, yep. who was the bench coach for the Royals, and he's been on their coaching staff for nine, 10 years. He's coming over as the new manager I know a lot of White Sox fans don't seem to know a whole lot about him. I think when we were hearing just kind of not really as much reporting as it was speculation of who could this manager be. Well, it could maybe it's Miguel Cairo, maybe it's Joe Espada, maybe it's someone like Bruce Bochy, or maybe even yeah, a Joe Madden. Bay. Well, the Tampa Bay guy too, Quintero. 
who yeah, uh, uh, Quattaro, yeah, he took the KC job. So, yeah, there was a lot of names out there, and I thought all were good. Like you said, you know, you still had a Joe Madden, you still had an Ozzie Gian. Um, there were some season there were some new people uh with the ball club the way it's it's structured right now you do want someone that's going to hit the ground running not have to learn um that being said yeah we're actually at the ballpark here in about 30 minutes having a meet and greet with him so i'm looking forward to meeting him for the first time in person uh, i'm sure i crossed paths with him and may have met him in the past but i i don't recall it Everything I've heard about him is that, you know, he is a very good communicator. He is coming from an organization in Kansas City that you have to develop talent. You don't have big money. And so, like we've talked about how Houston has been so successful in, in maintaining that success where, you know, ironically, the Cubs didn't, you know, felt like the Cubs should have been doing what Houston's doing now and just were unable to sustain it, Houston's doing it. I think his repertoire, I think his um, communicative abilities, I think his um, I, I think his baseball acumen from the people I have spoken with in the last 48 hours, so to speak, it all say really positive things. So I'm looking forward to meeting him. I'm looking forward to, you know, maybe asking a couple questions from the crowd that are gonna be a little uncomfortable, like, Okay, yeah, and, and Rick Hahn is going to be there. And I've known Rick since he was in high school. He was at New Trier with my younger brother. Um, you know, last year was an underachieving year. You know, there were injuries again, but, you know, there were players that they were injured that were being told to a degree, you know, don't run too hard. Don't go after things too hard because we can't have you get re-injured or injure yourself further like what's going to be the message when you have someone that is underachieving in terms of talent in terms of mental ability you know what are the things that you are going to work on over the winter and in spring training to try to avoid those things going forward so i'm very excited to meet him and ask some you know some challenging questions um it'll be again maybe a little uncomfortable because rick hahn is going to be there and you know rick <laughs> was a part of what the guys had to go through last year and Rick had to have signed off on the fact that with so many injuries, certain players were told, look, you hit that two hopper right to the shortstop. Don't, don't go 90%, like go 50%. And the problem is that sometimes translates into that ball in the outfield. You're not going 90% because you can't go hundred because you're kind of hurt, but you're going 50. And then other teams were taking second base on a base hit. You know, all of a sudden a shortstop bobbles a ball and by the time he picks it up and throws it, you're still out by a step or two instead of being 90 percent running through it and making it safe. So I want to find out, like, you know, the things that he did in Kansas City to motivate the guys on a team that clearly was payroll wise, talent wise, not comparable to others. But how, you know, did he try to elevate their games like, uh, you know, a Meriwether, like a Salvador Perez? And then, you know, what's he going to do to help this ball club, you know, get back to the way they played that first half of 2020, where, you know, I don't think anyone thought this wasn't a team that could make a deep run and get to a World Series. 2021, you mean? Or 2021, right. Yeah. 2020, good team, too. I think that uh, you mentioned a couple times his communication skills, and he is bilingual. I know that is going to go a long way in this dugout with a right. lot of a lot of players from Central America, Cuba specifically, and Latin players. Yeah, Charlie Montoya, the, the bench coach, I think is a great pickup as well. Someone that can, you know, he can say something. I can walk down like Miguel Cairo was for Tony and say to a Latin player in Spanish, like you know, you got to do better. Like, <laughs> what the hell was that? Like, whatever. So you have two guys, Montoya with managerial experience, but bilingual, Grafal with that bilingual capability. Uh, you know, the fact that here was a guy that played for 13 years in the minor leagues as a catcher. So he was thinking, he was obviously working through all those paginations of what's happening early, middle, end of a game. Um, and then the career he's had, you know, been on people's radar, maybe not the top of the list, you know, the last kind of three to five years, but clearly someone that has been on people's radar as a potential manager candidate. So I, I'm excited to kind of meet him in person and talk with him today and excited for what the prospects hold for the White Sox next year and the year after. I think it's very interesting because I think 
there are three different kinds of managers that teams have been hiring over the last few years. Number one, there are the guys such as the Buck Showalters, the Joe Girardis, the proven managers who continue to get opportunities as they should because look at what look at how the Mets transformed the culture of their team. Oh, like yeah. Showed up. Yeah. Number two, this trend seems to be dying a little bit, but about three or four years ago, everyone wanted to hire an Aaron Boone, a David Ross, a Jace Tingler, yep. Gabe Kapler, guys with very, very limited, yep. if any, coaching if experience. Any, right. Been in like, the TV booth kind of watching the games, but <laughs> haven't really been on the field in the minors or the majors. But you know what? You've got a kind of a good pedigree. We're going to – Give you some, I mean, some have worked very well, some yeah. not so well. Um, I think that trend is kind of disappearing based on – it's still going to exist. But based on who a lot of these teams hired, I mean, Bruce Bochy just got hired. Uh, Quattaro just got hired. And I think that's what we saw. Um, that's the third category I bring up are these baseball lifers. Like yeah. Grafal or Rob Thompson is a good yeah. example. Guys who – have really worked their way up to that position, have done everything that you could do aside from manage at the major league level. And I thought it was a huge uh, disservice to those guys a few years ago when this trend started sweeping in. And some of these, there are other, some, some other good examples, just guys who have really worked, basically, like I said, they've done everything you could ask for to become a manager. And yet a guy who with, no experience whatsoever, Carlos Beltran or David Ross or whomever it is, right. just steps in and gets that job. Um, I'm glad to see some more of these guys like yeah. Grafal getting these opportunities because I think personally, Mike, I think those guys naturally, all things being equal, make better managers than the guys with no experience whatsoever. Oh, I, I would agree. Schilt in St. Louis was another one, just the yeah. life for that. Nick Kerr, another yeah. one. Right. Um, it, it's that – in some ways you, you want that big splash in some ways you want it to give your fan base that recognizable person uh the person that had success and that someone as you talk to feels like he can have that success again but to me there's nothing like experience um there's nothing like someone who has ridden a bus with the guys who has managed at multiple levels has kind of put themselves in every situation and for those that have success at those minor league levels and become the bench coach or first base coach or something in the major leagues you know that to me is the person that i want to bring in even though it might not be sexy um it's someone that i truly feel like will help my ball club get to the playoffs or not just get to the playoffs get deep into the playoffs we all know again you can get hot you can have an injury to win a world series sometimes it's luck as well as as skill but how do you put yourself in a position to get to that world series on a consistent basis like houston is doing and i agree with you i think it's those people that have the experience um, whether it's major league or minor league but they also have to understand that the analytics are analytics for a reason it's like it, this is non-biased you know this guy hits a ball to this part of the ballpark every time when you throw this type of pitch so let's put three people over there and have our pitchers pitch to that spot because he's going to hit rocket after rocket after rocket right there and if we have two guys there or three guys there he's going to be out versus just saying well go in out up down change speeds and let's have our our team like sitting in normal fielding positions no no no. You, you have to understand the analytics and know when and how to use them and then again to, like we've talked about you have to trust your gut which is where i think those lifers you know even you know the dusty bakers have learned how to say you know what i know this is what the book is saying i know this is what the analytics is saying but right now i'm seeing with my eye my pitcher is just sinking it sinking it sinking it and that means the guy's going to roll over ground ball. So that means the guy's – so I'm keeping my shift not quite as far. I'm keeping my players here just because I'm seeing in this game my pitcher is not pitching a normal game like we're asking him to. He's pitching something different, so I'm moving my players somewhere different. And that's what I want to see. I want to see managers managing. I don't want this stuff where the front office is basically telling the manager everything that they should do which right. I think happens probably, I'll, I'll put it this way, if a guy has not 
managed to get to that position, if he doesn't have experience, then the front office believes that maybe they need to point him and guide him a little more. I would rather hire a guy who, hey, you know what? He's been on the bench for 10 years. He's And then another thing you mentioned, he caught in the minor leagues for 13 years. Catchers make great managers. Great they're managers, thinking, yes. They're thinking at every juncture yeah. of the game. So yeah. it would be interesting to see what, what happens here. Yeah, I'm very excited, like I said. I'm very excited to meet him and very excited for the prospects here on the south side for the next couple of years. Well, the White Sox are going to have quite a bit more to do this offseason. Yes. And uh, I'm sure we will get to a chance to talk about that mm -hmm. later uh, this offseason. So um, I'm sure we'll do that. I'd love to have you back then, Mike, anytime. But uh, what would you – would you like to promote the youth baseball or anything? Uh, would you like to point anyone towards – no, I would just say right now, the uh, whitesocks.com slash play is where you're going to find our programming. We're sort of in that winter mode that we'll be doing some camps over the holidays. Uh, my coaches right now are doing a lot of team training for other organizations as well as our travel teams. In the spring, we go very heavy working with Little Leagues on helping do coaches clinics and sort of teaching the parents how to run a first practice. So for right now, I would just continue to go to that whitesocks.com slash play and just see when something is coming up. And, and if you are around for the holidays, you want to give your son or daughter something fun, please register them up. We do camp sort of western suburbs, sometimes a little bit further north and a little bit further south. But uh, when we talk, when the season begins, uh, the fun one of the fun parts of my job is our summer camps, which we do for kids 5 through 12 Um and just let kids for a week long in the mornings or afternoons really kind of learn the game and have a lot of fun, uh, do some progressive training. Everyone gets some tickets and comes to the ballpark, gets to be a part of a ballpark experience. So it's that's kind of one of the really fun things that we'll talk about after the first of the year. Awesome. Well, Mike, I really hope that a month from now we're talking about some big free agent signing or trade that the White Sox have made. And uh, love to have you back to weigh in on that. Love to do it, Jack. Thanks. Continue right. success. Thank you. Have a great day, Mike. Appreciate you it. You too. Yep. All right. So that concludes our conversation today with Michael Huff. A great time having him here on the show. Great guy. It was a lot of fun talking with him. If you guys enjoyed today's episode of the Jack Vita Show, make sure you subscribe to the Jack Vita Show on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Like I said, I'm on those social media platforms. You can follow me at Jack Vita Show and then subscribe to the podcast because we're going to have more of this, more where this, there's more where, more of this where it came from. I don't know how to say it. More where, more of where this came from. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm tripping over my words. It's an early morning. I'm tired. I was up late for the World Series last night. Uh, but, we only got a couple games left. We'll be back after the World Series sometime next week to recap it. We'll talk about the new World Series champions. Could be the Philadelphia Phillies. It's not over yet, folks. They could do what the Washington Nationals did two years ago. It's a team that believes in itself and it wants to go to war together. So I don't believe this series is over quite yet. Make sure you guys check it out. We'll have some more conversations with great guests over the next uh really all off season we'll be doing some probably do some college basketball talk little nfl college football um now that we're moving into the winter sports but we'll also be covering baseball as well we'll have some more great guests on from the world of sports from the world of entertainment some big brother survivor contestants i can't wait for you guys to see who we've got coming on this show so like i said make sure you're following along on social media so you'll see when i announce that i have a new episode and who the guest is going to be if you want to ask them any questions and subscribe to the show so you don't miss any of the content that we have coming out okay until our next episode i'm jack vita bring in the dancing lobsters <laughs>